I'm Sepide Bonavo. I'm a dentist and a specialist in restorative dentistry and dental materials and um, a dental public health diplomat. Um, I'm really glad to be here today in research clinical excellence day after three years. And um, it's good to be here really um, see people 3D and maybe 4D or 5D because we have our minds, feeling and senses all present here. So it's really valuable. And I really happy that all of us have this chance to be here today. It was really you know, frustrating just sit over Zoom and you know, it's really hard, but um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm honored to mother, um, sorry, I, you may have seen, um, I'm assistant professor at um, Oral Epidemiology and Dental Public Health Division at uh, Preventive Dentistry and Restorative, um, sci uh, sorry, Preventive and Restorative Dental Sciences Department, uh, PRDS. Um, I'm going to moderate today's oral presentations. We have fantastic oral presenters uh, from uh, second year dental students to postdoc and uh, PhD candidates. Um, so I'm sure that you will learn a lot. Um, our first oral presenter is Pamela Vargas. Um, she is second year dental student and she's going to talk about her research, uh, which is cultural mismatch with providers and perceptions of care quality among Hispanic patients within a dental care setting. Please welcome Pamela. Hi, everyone. Um, I would like to preface this by saying my project was heavily influenced by my own experiences, going to the dentist for the first time at the age of eight years old and being the sole translator for my mother, which led to poor patient relations with our dentist. That being said, my project is cultural mismatch with providers and perception of care quality among Hispanic patients within a dental care setting. My name is Pamela Vargas. I'm a second year dental student here at UCSF, and I worked in collaboration with Dr. Enihomo Obadan Udo, whom I would like to thank for her immense help on this project. Going into a bit of background, about 18% of the U.S. population is estimated to be Hispanic, while only 6% of provider, dental providers are Hispanic. This often leads to language differences and different cultural beliefs, which results in differences of quality of healthcare, especially for Hispanic population. A proposed solution is to produce culturally competent healthcare by using culturally sensitive methods and language services. The overall goal, I would like to present the IHI triple aim, which is to increase overall population health, decrease the per capita cost of access to care, and increase the experience of care, which we chose to quantify in this survey using the Interpersonal Care Quality Survey or IPC survey. Going into how to quantify care using the IPC survey. So the IPC survey is a well-developed instrument, which has a total of 18 questions. Those questions are further subdivided into seven domains. These domains are lack of clarity, elicited concerns, explained results, decided together, emotional support, discrimination due to race and ethnicity, and disrespectful office staff. Each question is graded on a Likert scale of one to five, one being never and five being always. And then we then take the mean of those averages per domain to quantify each domain for care. Going into previous studies and what remains to be done, in one study of community pharmacy, lack of Spanish-speaking healthcare workers was one of the factors shown to poorly influence patient satisfaction. 
In another study of three community health centers, self-scored cultural competency amongst providers was one of the main factors associated with high parent scores of quality childcare. Overall, few studies have addressed cultural mismatch as an impediment to adequate care, nor have they pinpointed specific ways this leads to poor patient perspectives, even less so within dental settings, which is what this study aimed to do. Going into our specific aims, our aim was to assess the proportion of Hispanic patients who feel culturally matched to their dental providers through language, ethnicity, and respect for cultural beliefs. We then examined and evaluated those three domains for IPC care quality. Going into our methods, we developed a 35 item questionnaire derived from published instruments, which is listed on the right. We then use social media advertisements through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to recruit Hispanic individuals who had a, a recent visit within the last three years. We analyzed IPC means, demographics, and controlled for confounding variables using t-tests all coded within R. This is an example of the social media advertisements that were shown on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, just for reference, around 3,400 individuals clicked on the survey link, 222 took the actual survey, and 154 individuals were deemed eligible based on our screening criteria. Going into demographics and the major groups of our population, about 60% of individuals were aged 25 to 54, and 70% of respondents were female. The average income was about 35 to 100K with about 50%, and the average education was four-year college graduates or more, around 40% of respondents. Going a bit into cultural mismatch, we asked um, respondents whether they believe their provider was of Hispanic origin, and about 66% said that they were not. Going into how well dentists understand health-related cultural beliefs, respondents were asked on a scale of poor, fair, good, and excellent, and about 65% of individuals rated their, their dentists as poor or fairly understanding cultural beliefs. Going into the IPC domains, which are shown on the right, these graphs um, compare the domains, which are shown one through seven horizontally. Um, if we comp compare amongst provider Hispanic versus provider not Hispanic, we see those with a Hispanic provider tend to have higher means or about the same means as those who do not have a Hispanic provider. And however, none of these were statistically significant. Going into mean score per IC, IPC domain by provider understanding of health-related cultural beliefs, we created groups by those who rated them as poor slash fair and good slash excellent. Those who rated them as poor slash fair tended to have lower IPC domain means than those who rated them good slash excellent across all seven domains. And six out of seven of those domains were statistically significant, and they're highlighted here on the right. Going into a bit of interpreted services of our population, about 24% or 37 individuals said they sometimes, usually, or always needed interpreter within the last three years. Going into who actually received interpretive services of those people who needed an interpreter, more than 50% of individuals reported only sometimes or never actually receiving an interpreter. Going into mean score per IPC domain by need for interpreter, those who needed an interpreter were reporting lower scores across all seven domains compared to those who did not need an interpreter, and five out of those seven of those domains were actually statistically significant. They are also highlighted here on the right. In conclusion, culturally competent healthcare and cultural sensitive methods can definitely be attained even when patient and provider backgrounds differ. However, the data shows the importance of understanding patient cultural beliefs and IPC domains that can be affected if this is not adhered to. The data also highlights IPC domains that are modifiable to improve the quality of care for Hispanic dental patients whenever translation is needed. Thank you for your time. I will now take my time.
Right on time. Thank you so much. I know, I had the timer. <laughs> I practiced that. <laughs> I showed two minutes in the card. I show you one minute. Uh, any question from audience? I have a question for you. Uh, what are some of your uh, you know, challenges that you have for this project? And also, what did you learn about social media advertisements? Yeah, so um, social media advertisements was def definitely difficult. One of the reasons being you really have to monitor comments um, and likes basically 24 hours of the day because people are commenting and liking different things. Um, in terms of monitoring likes and comments, you can keep comments that are, you know, I guess interesting, but if they're kind of like putting down the, the survey or the study, you kind of have to filter those out. But we found that um, advertisements that did have comments on, on them actually performed better than those that did not. Um, another thing was actually targeting the correct demographic. So I'm a 24 year old female. So when I first started the project, I was only targeting 24 year old females. <laughs> And then I had to bring my mom and my dad into the project who are around the age of 40. And then they, you know, they really helped us target um, different genders and different age groups. And we're hoping to continue the project so that that age group continue to, you know, diversify. Thank you, Thank so you for your question. So our next presenter is Darnell Kyler. Uh, he is second year dental student and research fellow. Uh, and his uh, research is about uh, calcium phosphate particle systems for anti-resorptive drug delivery and minimizing orthodontic relapse. Please welcome. People are watching the screen, so it's suggested to use the mouse, but if you're- That's fine, I think this one's okay. Which question is it? Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Darnell Kyler. I'm a fourth year DDS PhD in the labs of Drs. Tadel Desai and Sunil Kapila. And today I'll give you a brief glimpse into some of the thesis work I've been working on the last couple of years. And so, as some of you may all know, orthodontic treatment is really critical for our oral health, improving masticatory functions, and over improving our overall well being. Um, and the process of orthodontic tooth movement is really driven by osteoclastic activity seen here on the pressure side. So upon orthodontic forces, there's a cascade of events from inflammation, cytokine secretion, which will lead to this activity seen here. And on the opposite side, terms of tension side, osteoblast deposit new bone. And it's coordinated activity of these two things that really facilitate orthodontic tooth movement. But one of the major issues within the field of orthodontics is orthodontic relapse, or the reversal of treatment back into its original position. And over the last couple of decades, the field has really been focusing on a, a subset of processes that could be facilitating this process. And it's been really strongly associated with the reversal of the things that we see during OTM, where osteoclast activity are now uh, resorbing the bone on that tension, that former tension side, and uh, osteoblasts are acting on that pressure side. And so, because of the limitations that we see with current uh, methods for uh, retention of tooth, uh, a tooth movement, really the field's been focusing on biomodulation of tooth movement. And so the Capilla Lab has really focused on using osteoprotegrin or OPG, which is a key inhibitor of osteoclast activity seen here. So the rank ligand and rank is a really important signaling access for inducing osteoclast activation and downstream resorption. But with the introduction of OPG, you can block all those things and induce apoptosis. And so utilizing this in an in vivo, in vivo model, we've shown that using um, rats as a model where we move teeth for 28 days and look at relapse of 24 and giving injections of OPG at either five MIGs or one MIG, we could see a, a significant decrease in the amount of orthodontic tooth movement or an orthodontic relapse. And so, however, what we had saw in this study was that multiple injections actually lead to elevated systemic levels of OPG, which could be uh, debilitating for long bones um, elsewhere in the system. And so it really leads me to my uh, research question of can controlled sustained release from a material platform improve efficacy and stimulate bone healing? And so I took inspiration from our own human body in that it really, we, our bones have this unique um, hierarchical structure from the nanoscale from collagen molecules. Um, and then 
it gets infiltrated by hydroxyapatite, which really gives our bones its stiffness. And so hydroxyapatite as a material is really um, impressive in that it has osteoconductive properties, so it can stimulate osteoblast activity on its surface. It's biocompatible, and we can tune it for drug delivery. And so taking this into consideration, I wanted to create hydroxyapatite microparticles. And so to do so, I use a calcium carbonate templating method in that through these chemical processes, you can induce precipitation of hydroxyapatite onto the surface through this hydrothermal reaction and through other chemical processes really elude out that inner core, leaving behind this hollow particle. And this hollow particle is really important because it improves the loading uh, efficiency of drugs for drugs. And in this case, osteoprotegrin. And so as you can see here from these scanning electron micrographs, um, during the hydrothermal reaction step, we can control the pH. And so at pH 9, we get this coarse uh, surface topography with the 5 micron particle. And then further increasing the pH, we can get this um, needle-like uh, needle -like surface topography. So from here on after, I'll refer to these as C-haps and N-haps. And then further looking at these with transmission electron microscopy, you can see the surface crystals have this distinct point-like features and more needle-like. So again, these processes are uh, important in for biological functions as well. And so further characterizing this, I looked at the calcium release profile, and you can see that the NHAPs have a, um, a much more higher in increase in calcium uh, release. And to understand kind of why that's happening, we further characterize this with infrared spectroscopy. And we can assess this um, through, we can attribute this to the car carbonate to phosphate ratios. And again, these um, calcium release profiles are important for other biological processes. And so next, I wanted to really use these for a drug delivery platform. And so using five mix of particles and loading it with osteoprotegrin, we get significantly high levels of uh, protein loading, over 200 micrograms. But between the two particles, we don't see a, a significant difference. And then looking at the release profile in vitro, we can see that over the course of 40 months, days, we see sustained release with almost 100% being released over this duration. But one thing that you're seeing here is that this is really typical first order release kinetics, where over 50% of the proteins being released uh, within the first five days. And so I wanted to develop a method to work. How can we further tune this without inhibiting the surface of the hydroxyapatite? And so most strategies really use synthetic polymers to coat, but I didn't want to impede the hydroxyapatite surface itself. And so utilizing an ionic uh, species, I basically precipitate on layers of more hydroxyapatite to really maintain that surface, but also decrease the amount of drug that's being released. And so in doing so, I can dramatically decrease the amount of protein that's coming out of these particles without impeding the duration of release. And so next, I wanted to ensure that the protein loading um, of these particles is maintained um, and so to do so, we use an in I used an in vitro osteoclast differentiation assay in that I collected primary uh, bone marrow-derived macrophages and differentiated them in the presence of rank ligand. And as you can see, there's um, robust uh, formation of osteoclasts with over 150. But when I treat these osteoclasts with these OPG loader particles, the C hats particularly, with an increase in particle concentration per centimeter squared, we see a significant reduction in osteoclast formation. And then when we treat with non-loaded particles, although not statistically different, we see a, a trend decreasing. And we see similar results seen with the NHAPs. When treated with the osteoclast, we see a, a reduction in the uh, number formed. And so really what I've shown you today is that in, in our lab that we can develop these hollow microparticles with distinct surface topographies and compositions. They release OPG over the duration of 41 days, which is uh, within the realm of what we want. And then they can, the, the protein post-loading is still bioactive. And so next is really to evaluate these in an orthodontic model uh, of relapse. And we have some preliminary data to suggest that, the, um, that these particles are able to be injected um, and release the protein. And so I really want to thank Dr. Desai and the people in the lab who have helped me alongside the Capilla lab and Laura Fu. I don't know if she's here, but she's been a significant amount of help. Uh, the Jean Lab, the Hablet Lab, and Galadio Kazaki, and then all my funding sources from the NIDCR, the School of Dentistry, and Amgen, who supplies OPG. That's super cool. Very interested in the, um, the uh, capsules in which you're encapsulating the protein. My question is, do you need those osteoclasts? How many are you eliminating? And what, what do you think about having a few left? What's the, uh, what's the importance there? And, and can you 
um, add that to your protocol? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the osteoclasts are important because there's a crosstalk between the osteoblast. And so in terms of the drug release profile, as you saw, being able to kind of tune the amount um, is really important for at least the, the protocol itself. Um, right now, I'm still working on a, a co-culture system to basically see how much OPG can be delivered from the particles to impede some function of the osteoclast, but still maintain some of the paracontractors um, that could be facilitating osteoblast activity. Um, Justine's, Lee, Justine's Lee group has shown a lot of this in terms of really looking at delivery of OPG and how does that cross interact. And so kind of taking that into account, trying to tune the delivery in terms of how can we make it most beneficial for both cell types. Excellent. Um, so my question is twofold. Number one, where do you foresee the challenges in clinically applied in small spaces? And you said you will inject. Is that local or systemic? I'm, I'm assuming it's local injections, right? Mm -hmm. How do you translate that to Invisalign, which is becoming kind of the gold standard where mm -hmm. it's much slower remodeling process? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any application to the Invisalign outcomes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the first part of your question in terms of the translation, um, I think when I was basically creating this project alongside my mentors, we were really aiming on using materials that are already used clinically. So hydroxyapatite you use for bone grafts and things like that. And OPG, although you guys may not know, but it's just the former of denusumab. And OPG has been using clinical trials and was able to be, show success. But for pharmacokinetic reasons, denusumab made it to the market. Um, so being able to kind of tune those things together was, I think, really was good for us from a translational perspective. Um, to your second question, I think in terms of Invisalign and just normal like, tooth movement, I think, again, this is post all those things. Um, I think there still needs to be taken into consideration how quickly you're moving teeth, where you're moving them, and how. Um, but I still think in terms of, of the application of these particles in the drug, um, because they are inject, it's an injection, um, it can still be utilized. I think there becomes a limitation in how many times they're injecting, though. <laughs> Orthodontic treatment, and then you have this relapse. Is there like a window where relapse is like most prevalent? Because you, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. like I got braces when I was 13 and then 28. So, you know, like when mm -hmm. I continue to get injections, or mm -hmm. is there like a specific window where you have the most tooth movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least from a lot of the animal models that people are really able to look at some of the biological functions and the cellular activity, the early, especially in the most severe case of relapse, when you just take the appliances off with no retention mode. Osteoclasts come in within the first seven to 12 days. Um, and so being able to impede that effect could really facilitate um, some of the retention modes, at least in our animal models, that's what we see. And that osteoclasts are coming in, if we inject OPG, we stop that. And the remodeling processes of the bone, as well as the PDL are able to basically facilitate retention. So I think in terms of long-term, I think uh, we haven't looked, no studies have looked past 24 days, but I think that's something that I'm particularly interested in. I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next presenter is Wilson Ng. He is third year orthodontic resident and his research is about dual shortwave infrared transillumination and reflectance imaging for caries detection. Please welcome Wilson. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Just test to make sure this actually works. Oh, perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Wilson, and my mentor is Dr. Daniel Fried. Today, I'm not going to talk about ortho to you guys. This is a project about using shortwave infrared imaging in dentistry. All right, so something hopefully all of us can agree on is that the earlier we can detect caries formation, the more likely we can use minimally invasive dentistry to stop or even reverse the process. That being said, though, some of the most difficult places to do this is on the occlusal surfaces, as well as interproximally between posterior adjacent dentition. This is because in clinic, uh, clinicians really have two main ways to diagnose decay. Number one, you can visually look at a tooth. And number two, 
we're going to take some x-rays. But in radiographs, not only is enamel overlapped on the occlusal surface, but by the time we do see a radiolucency, that occlusal lesion is probably pretty severe. We also know that bite wing radiographs have a relatively low uh, sensitivity when it comes to detecting early proximal decay that only extends into enamel. On the other hand, the problem with just visually uh, inspecting a tooth is that stains on a deep, um, you know, pits and fissures on the occlusal uh, surface make it difficult for most clinicians to definitively pinpoint the areas that are demineralized. Stains also have a tendency to make early lesions look more severe than they actually are. And if the newer generation of clinicians are being trained to refrain from sharp tactile probing, then this prompts a very good question of, is there a better way to do things? All right, so before we dive right in, it's important to note that the shortwave infrared spectrum lies between 1,000 to 2,500 nanometers. And the two imaging geometries I wanna focus on today are number one, transillumination, at which the light is shined at or below the gum line, and then number two, in reflectance, where the light source is directly above the occlusal surface, and then the camera can pick up a reflected uh, backscattering of light. So the power of imaging in the infrared is that sound tooth structure looks dramatically different than that of a lesion. So take a look at this graph here. As we increase the wavelength from visible into the near infrared, you'll see how this attenuation coefficient of enamel drops rapidly. This simply means that in translumination, healthy tooth scatters less light, which allows it to become more transparent-like. This is versus like lesions that will look dark because the light cannot be emitted through. And then if we bump up the wavelength even more above 1400, this is where you get a huge absorption of light by water, which means that in reflectance modality, sound tooth structure looks distinguishably dark as opposed to lesions, which can look bright due to micropores that scatter a bunch of light. In addition, not only does this technology use non-ionizing radia radiation, which is great, but we've also shown in the past that stains become fully transparent somewhere in the shortwave infrared spectrum. So with all of these advantages, it's not difficult to imagine then that there are already commercially available devices that try to exploit these properties. And yet they are using a lower wavelength of about 850 nanometers, which as you can see, doesn't take full advantage of the low light scattering and the high water absorption that is more characteristic of longer wavelengths leading to lower lesion contrast. And we've also demonstrated that stains aren't even fully transparent at the lower wavelengths. But even if theoretically, like these devices were to use the optimal wavelengths, the reality is that these imaging modalities on their own are not perfect imaging techniques either. So while they each offer a high sensitivity, what they lack is specificity, um, leading to false positives possibly. But what if we were to combine both imaging modalities into one single handheld probe that can simultaneously perform both transillumination and reflectance? So this is where my research project comes into play. Given the advantages of uh, infrared imaging, but also the limitations of each modality on their own, we wanted to see whether or not a probe of this kind can demonstrate a higher diagnostic performance than traditional radiography when it comes to detecting early lesions on uh, proximal surfaces and on the occlusal. So to do this, let me go ahead and just advance right here. Oh, is this stuck? Battery's running low. Not my fault, guys. <laughs> there we go. All right, so to do this, we recruited 36 of 40 patients so far um, who have needs for orthodontic extractions of two to four premolars. Before the extractions, we do in vivo imaging with a regular intraoral camera, as well as our dual probe. And then after the extraction, we go ahead and take some radiographs that simulate traditional bite wings, and then to confirm the presence of the lesion as well as the severity, we go ahead and send these samples off for micro CT or histology viewed under polarized light microscopy. Ultimately, three blinded clinicians who are general dentists will view all the images and they'll score them with the appropriate ICDOS scoring system. And then we'll go ahead and calculate sensitivity and specificity for all imaging modalities. 
So while our study is still ongoing, I wanted to share two samples, two of our earlier samples, that help illustrate how a probe of this kind could potentially aid clinicians. So consider our first uh, sample right here, this upper right bicuspid. We can appreciate the restorative material in the central groove, but wait, we do see something suspicious going on in the distal. Note that the mesial looks relatively unaffected. And so we'll take a look at the x-ray. I guess we could say that there it might be a slight radiolucency on the distal, and I'm not really seeing too much on the mesial. But when we look under the dual probe here in reflectance, we see that the lesion or the restorative material lights up, which is normal. But we can also see hot spots in the reflectance mode, both on the distal and the mesial, but especially on the distal. So we'll go ahead and take a look at translunation for uh, congruency checking. And we do see that there are areas both mesially and distally where light cannot be emitted through. Ultimately, we go ahead and take the histology of this tooth and confirm that there was indeed a lesion not only on the distal, but also the mesial. And note that while the x-ray was not able to help us detect the lesion on the mesial, that our dual probe was able to give us a hint of something fishy going on. But what about protecting the patient from false positives? All right, consider um, a very similar tooth from a different patient. Just visually looking at this image, it's like, probably impossible to say definitively whether or not there are you know, early lesions on either proximal surfaces or occlusal surface. And then if we take a look at the x-ray, again, I do see something on the distal. I don't really see anything on the occlusal, and I don't really see too much on the mesial. But if we can learn anything from the last sample is that bite wings don't offer a high sensitivity for early lesions on the mesial. All right, but what about looking at our dual probe? So in the transillumination mode, we can see that there are zones both mesially and distally where light cannot be emitted through, which leads me to suspect that there are lesions uh, on both sides. But we got to check with reflectance. And what I'm seeing is a huge hot spot on the distal, mild hot spots along the central groove, and then pretty much nothing on the mesial. All right, if we take a look at the digital slice from micro CT, we confirm that there was indeed a distal lesion. There was something going on on the occlusal, but the mesial enamel was totally sound. And so note that while the x-ray could not detect um, demon on the occlusal, that our dual probe gave us a hint that something was going on on the occlusal surface. But more importantly, this sample helps us illustrate how we can use both imaging modalities to cross-check for false positives when it comes to the mesial. All right, so uh, just to quickly recap, um, imaging beyond the near infrared allows us to uh, best visualize our lesions. Doing so will also help us greatly reduce interferences from stains, allowing us to see the lesion that could potentially be underneath. And then lastly, as we are recruiting our last four patients, I am hopeful that our final data will reflect how a dual probe of this kind could um, basically enable better detection rates for early demon on these difficult surfaces, ultimately allowing clinicians to more readily use minimally invasive dentistry and better serve our patients. So on that note, I'd like to thank my mentors, Dr. Freed, Dr. Darling. I see Yihua back there. Um, and then also I'd like to thank the audience for listening to my talk and bearing with me. In orthodontics, for traditional treatment, when you remove the bands, very often you'll see a surface demineralization because of improper hygiene or simply physically, right? Don't, do you see an application of this for uh, oh, your absolutely. field? I mean, okay. we all know that um, orthodontic appliances, whether it's fixed appliances or Invisalign, as you mentioned in the previous question, they make for great plaque harbors. And so we do know that there is a lot of like, early demineralization that is going on. So absolutely, I foresee that a technology of this kind will just aid all clinicians from all different specialties in just um, more early uh, detection of things that could be going on. And so we could educate the patient and just show them. Thank you so all much. Right, thank you. For
weren't they fantastic? Uh, so next we have clinical cases. Um, our uh, next presenter is Donna Baldetti, and um, she is a third year dental student. And uh, her research is case exploration of amylogenesis imperfecta subtype four. Please welcome Donna. All right, hi everyone, my name is Donna. Um, today I'm gonna to be presenting, um, I'm gonna be doing a clinical case exploration on amylogenesis imperfecta. Not sure which one. Is this one? Yeah. So um, in order to do my abbreviated case report, I just want to um, give everyone an overview of what amylogenesis imperfecta or AI is. Um, amylogenesis refers to enamel formation, um, imperfecta is imperfect. Um, there are four main different subtypes. Uh, there's type one, which is hypoplastic. That's the most common type of AI you'll see. It's about 60 to 70% of cases. There's also type two, which is hypomaturation, type three, hypocalcified. And then type four is kind of um, a combination of the first three types. There's, it's hypomature, hypoplastic enamel with uh, pterodontism. The incidence of AI is one in 14,000 in most populations. However, it's one in 700 in Swedish populations fact is that there's a uh, related hominid species to homo sapiens where the rate of AI was one in three. Um, due to the rarity of the more severe presentations of AI, um, relatively few treatment options exist, especially for patients um, on state-sponsored dental insurances such as Denical. Okay, so I also just want to cover the pattern of inheritance with AI. So there's currently many uh, distinct gene mutations associated with AI. Most of these gene mutations are in uh, most of these genes are responsible for the synthesis of enamel. Um, patterns of inheritance can be autosominant, autosomal recessive, or X-linked, though many are autosomal dominant and X-linked. Um, in X-linked patterns, patterns of inheritance, uh, males present with more severe clinical cases of AI, um, whereas the females, um, so for example, in the males, you see uniform um, uh, lack of enamel, whereas in the females, you see kind of uh, scattered patches of enamel. So there's some areas with normal enamel and some areas with abnormal enamel. Um, and then at the bottom, I showed um, the MLX gene, which is a melogenin X isoform gene, uh, and that's located on the X chromosome. And to date, there's about 10 distinct mutations that they have found that um, relate to uh, presentation of AI in the clinic. Okay, so I just wanna go over my abbreviated clinical case report. Um, this is the most meaty slide, so I'll just kind of summarize it. Um, so in clinic, we had a 26-year-old uh, male to female, uh, pronounced the down patient, come in with a chief complaint of generalized tooth sensitivity, uncomfortable bite causing pain, and loss of previously placed crowns. Um, patient came in uh, interested in receiving a full mouth extraction with um, a complete denture over a complete denture. Um, so then also, I just uh, to go quick through the slide, um, they, this patient did have a significant previous dental history. Um, they received crowns in all um, 28 teeth uh, three years ago in 2019 at private practice. However, uh, within a year and a half, the crowns begin to um, essentially come off. And um, when this patient uh, came to clinic, um, they had nine remaining crowns. Okay, so this patient had um, a positive family history of AI. Um, starting with their maternal grandfather. Um, it was also passed to the maternal uncle, um, their mother, and then their sister. Um, so they report that their mother and sister have a less severe presentation of AI um, than their grandfather and themselves. Um, this suggests that it's possible that um, their specific mutation may be X-linked. Okay, just to look at the X-rays really briefly, um, these X-rays were taken at another um, dental office. Um, you can see in the upper right picture, um, you can see um, the really uh, short crowns. Um, you can see um, how close the surface of the tooth is to the pulp chambers. Um, you also will notice on the upper molars, um, you still have three remaining crowns. Um, on the upper right uh, picture, we have evidence of, we have a deciduous tooth and then an uh, uninterrupted tooth below it. And then in the three pictures on the, on the bottom, we have the, the mandibular interiors. We still have some crowns uh, remaining there, as well as some supernumerary teeth on the left and right hand side pictures. Okay, um, for physical examination, uh, this patient had a very low DMFT index. Um, they had mixed dentition with decimals between the teeth, um, as well as inadequate feral, it appeared for the crowns. 
um, periodontal exam, there's gingivitis, um, but no generalized plaque or calculus, no significant cal, no tooth mobility. Um, the CRA, um, I was kind of in between, but I did say moderate just due to the low DMFT and some other um, factors as well. Um, with the prosthodontic exam, it was determined that this patient had significantly reduced VDO or a collapsed bite, and the treatment option um, was really a full mouth reconstruction needed for this patient. Um, and just to over, do an overview of what treatment looks like for AI patients, um, it's ideal that diagnosis and treatment of this condition starts in early childhood to prevent uh, restorative issues in the future. Um, a lot of AI patients with less severe uh, manifestations of amelogenesis receive bonded uh, veneer restorations. This mainly just addresses the aesthetic concerns of the patient. Um, and then there's also um, significantly reduced longevity and uh, poor prognosis of restore, restorative treatment for AI patients, just because the bonding of resin to dentin is often, often less uh, strong than that to of enamel. Um, so when we when we're want to do a comprehensive treatment for AI patients, we really need to consider multiple different factors. We need to preserve the tooth structure. We need to, we need to decrease the tooth sensitive, sensitivity that also comes along with patients who have AI. We need to look at restoring the VDO or vertical dimension of occlusion. And of course, we need to also um, try to improve aesthetics as, as much as possible. Um, so for more complex cases of AI, an uh, interdisciplinary approach is really needed for full mouth rehabilitation. Um, so this requires multiple different specialists working in tandem. Uh, to create a comprehensive treatment plan for this pa for patients like this. Um, a huge issue though with patients who do have amelogenesis imperfecta is the cost of the treatment. Um, oftentimes the cost of treatment is um, in the thousands of dollars and um, it is difficult to uh, get uh, comprehensive insurance coverage for this condition. Um, so something that I just really wanted to bring awareness to is that um, kind of more in the public health sector of dentistry, um, we should really work more to lessen the financial burden for patients uh, with AI and improve access to much needed comprehensive care because these patients uh, not only, you know, carry AI as a physical burden, but also as an emotional and financial burden. Um, and it really shouldn't be that way. Um, and that is all, thank you. <laughs> Hello, great presentation. Um, so what was the reason the patient got the 28 crowns from the previous dentist, if you know? I believe it was the previous dentist just um, attempt at providing treatment for the for, patient. For like aesthetic concerns? Or? Yeah, and the patient's sister did have crowns placed that um, actually have held up for quite a while now. So I believe they tried to follow kind of a similar treatment plan, uh, maybe without considering as much the increased severity of this patient's case versus um, their sisters. Okay, yeah. cool, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just interested in when you start seeing this phenotype in patients. Is it, is it, you know, as soon as they get teeth? What's the... Um... Yeah, yeah, you can see it as soon as they get teeth. Um, there's been plenty of uh, clinical case reports I've seen. Um, a lot of times they're of children as young as three, four, five. Um, and that's kind of the ideal time when you want to treat um, the children. Most uh, pediatric patients uh, actually receive stainless steel crowns. So that's a pretty common treatment. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. It's very informative. Um, may I ask about, does the patient have sensitivity? Yes. Because of the, okay. Mm -hmm. And I also want to know that um, because I see there's no contact point on most of the teeth, do they have malocclusion because of that? Yes, pretty severe malocclusion, yeah. So um, how do you do orthodontic treatments if there's no enamel? enamel? Uh, it's really hard. So the patient, um, when they were a teenager, did a, there was an attempt at orthodontic treatment. However, um, the, the pretty much the braces didn't hold. They popped out within about a week. So do you recommend them put on temporary crowns to do to put on braces on it? Uh, sorry, say that again. Um, do you have to put temporary crowns to do orthodontic treatment? Um, I it wouldn't be recommended. So just bond it on dentin, if possible. 
if possible, although before any of that happens, uh, you know, to kind of get their VDO reestablished, we'd have to do a lot of prosthodontic treatment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, our next presenter is Kate Lindsay. Uh, she's a second year dental student, and she's going to talk about uh, her research on role of P75 neurotropin, neurotropin receptor in skeletal development using conditional knockout mice. Please go. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Kate Lindsay and I work in Dr. Christine Hong's lab and I've been investigating the role of P75 NTR in skeletal development using conditional knockout mice models. So as you guys have heard, bones are really dynamic organs that have the ability to be restored and respond to stimuli and they're constantly being maintained throughout your life. And it's the complex gene interactions and signaling pathways that control the cell fate of mesenchymal stem cells and thus their phenotypes. So when these processes are disturbed, bone diseases such as osteoporosis can occur. Osteoporosis is one of the most prevalent bone diseases with over 200 million people affected worldwide. By harvesting the self-renewing properties of mesenchymal stem cells, um, these kinds of treatments have shown really great pro promise as regenerative treatment. However, therapeutic utility of mesenchymal stem cells for bone regeneration hinges upon the understanding of the mechanisms that control the commitment of mesenchymal stem cells towards osteogenic, osteogeneration, regeneration, which is what Dr. D'Souza mentioned earlier. So P75 NTR, it's a nerve growth factor receptor and uh, it's best characterized for its role in nerve cell differentiation and survival. But emergency, emerging evidence has showed that P75 and NGF signaling through these types of receptors may play a role in osteogenic differentiation. Recent studies from the Hong lab have showed that when you delete P75 globally, meaning in every cell type, there is a growth retardation um, effect seen in cartilage and bone. But um, P75's role in skeletal biology still remains largely unclear. Thus, the goal of this experiment, these experiments were to really investigate the role P75 and TR plays in skeletal development and do this with uh, two different conditional knockout mice models that allow us to isolate the deletion of P75 with tissue specificity and control the deletion, which allows us to really study gene function in these tissues. So first I'll start with the conditional knockout, which is tissue specific. So in this model, you see our gene of interest, P75 NTR, and it's flanked by two LOX P sites. Um, Cree recombinase is able to basically cut like molecular scissors at these LOX P sites and therefore effectively de delete our gene of interest. Um, what is innovative about this approach is that the PRX1 promoter is only expressed in mesenchymal stem cells, thus limiting this deletion to only mesenchyme. So in this model, we saw that conditional knockout mice displayed a significant decrease in both body weight and femur length, um, telling us that P75 does play a role in mesenchymal differentiation. Zooming in a little bit further, I looked at the trabecular and cortical long bone, and I found that um, trabecular bone volume and trabecular number were greatly reduced in the conditional knockout mice, as well as cortical bone volume. But when is this gene really important in skeletal development? So in order to investigate further, um, I, we use this conditional inducible knockout design, which allows for not only to us to target mesenchymal stem cells, but also have temporal control of the deletion event. So in this, I'll briefly go over this. The inducible system is under control of the same mesenchymal stem cell promoter, 
Therefore, any cell that expresses PRX also expresses this Cre recombinase protein. What's special about this Cre recombinase is this um, modified estrogen receptor. And this basically allows us to control um, when the Cre ERT is able to come into the nucleus with tamoxifen. So I injected mice um, starting at P1 the first day. Um, and this activates the Cre ERT protein to translocate into the nucleus act as that molecular scissor, bleed P75 in our target tissues. And this is innovative because it really gives us the ability to control when this deletion event occurs. So in these inducible mice, in order to know that the postnatal deletion of P75 was really resulting, or the phenotypes that we saw resulted from the postnatal deletion, uh, we first needed to check that the tamoxifen protocols effectively uh, induced postnatal deletion, and we verified this by immunofluorescence. And as you can see here, the green protein is positive against the PRX promoter, and it shows cells that are expressing PRX. It's basically the cells that we target. And then as you can see, when tamoxifen uh, was administered, P75 is deleted in the middle as the, there is no red, there's no antibody binding to the P75 protein. So you can see that that was in the azophysis. Here we have complete deletion in the middle image on the bottom in the growth plate, in the bone marrow, as well as the periosteum. So now that we know our tamoxifen protocols did induce the desired postnatal deletion of P75, um, I treated uh, mice with either vehicle group or tamoxifen. And this was really important to allow us to study um, the phenotypes that we saw and really correlate them to the postnatal deletion. And as you can see, um, my conditional knockout mice had significantly lower body weights. And importantly, there was no difference between my vehicle groups and our control tamoxifen group, allowing us to verify the efficacy of this um, study. Uh, condition, inducible conditional knockout mice also showed reduced femur lengths. And I really like this picture because it highlights the changes in architecture that we observed. And this really shows that there was some cellular ch activity changes that re uh, resulted in decreased proliferation and differentiation within this trabecular bone. As you can see, the structures are a lot different in uh, the inducible conditional knockout. Briefly, the trabecular bone in the inducible conditional knockout was found to be st statistically reduced uh, while cortical bone volume uh, was not statistically significant. So in conclusion, I effectively administered tamoxifen and established protocols for the postnatal deletion uh, for these inducible Cre editing models. Next, we verify that P75 is involved in both post involved in both prenatal bone growth development with the conditional model as well as postnatal skeletal development with the inducible conditional model. And collectively, this study uh, may provide novel therapeutic possibilities for osteoporosis and other bone diseases. Special thanks to my mentors, Dr. Hong and Dr. Jin Suksa. They really couldn't have done anything without them. And thank you all for listening. Any questions? Um, nice talk. Um, I'm just curious if you guys looked at other bones. I know you guys were just analyzing the femurs, but do you see any um, defects in uh, for other bones of the head or mandible or anything? Yeah, definitely. So where this project kind of started was that um, Dr. Hong was investigating um, stem using P75s as a, as a stem cell marker, uh, isolating dental mesenchymal stem cells of high osteogenic potential. So it really started in craniofacial bones. Um, and there has been research um, because P75 is known as um, a neur um, a yeah neural crest cell marker. Um, it has there is more research in craniofacial bones. And if you go to the poster session, um, one of my uh, colleagues, Byron, is also studying this in TMJ. Um, so we haven't really investigated in uh, long bone. And while establishing these models, it was a lot easier to investigate in the long bone than um, craniofacial. But that's our next steps. Um, great presentation. I just have a quick question. 
Are you planning on using histology to analyze the effects of P75 activity on osteoclasts? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm in the process of um, staining, and we really want to look at why we're seeing these phenotypes, and histology is going to help us do that. We want to stain with H&E and um, stain the, <laughs> we want to stain the cartilage, as well as um, trap staining to know what cells are contributing to these phenotypes. Hey, Kate. Great. Great talk. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering if you had any ideas about the source of the NGF that might be activating this P75 receptor in the mesenchymal cells, coming from the nerves or uh, local cells, autocrine signaling, something like that? Yeah, that's a really good, great question. <laughs> yeah, that's really great. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I wanted to know um, your thoughts on how your project can be clinically significant to the field of dentistry. Yeah, um, as I mentioned before, what was really interesting is that um, initially this project was used to isolate um, stem cells that had high odontogenic and contragenic potential uh, from third molar dental mesenchymal pulp. Sorry, dental pulp. So using those dental mesenchymal stem cells, um, you know, from third molars that are easily accessible and removed often um, could really have great utility for maybe rebuilding alveolar bone, implants, future uh, clinical applications. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next presenter is Nathan Griffin. He is a second year postdoc in Dr. Knox's lab, Department of Cell and Tissue Biology. Uh, his research is about programmatic building of secretory SNS is driven by neuronal epithelial, NRG1, ERBB3, MTORC2 signaling. A lot of acronyms that we're going <laughs> to learn about. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Hey, can I get a little lighter on the screen with the mouse? Or can I use the on screen? Yeah, yeah, this will show up. Yeah, do I press that? Yeah. Just go laser pointer. Yeah, my hands get too shaky to use other things. Yeah, cool. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for thanks to the School of Dentistry for giving me this chance to share some um, data with you today. Uh, so my name's Nathan Griffin, and I'm from the Knox Lab, where we're part of the Craniofacial Biology Department. And uh, today I'm going to be giving some um, data from a, a recently accepted paper in DevCell, actually. So I just want to shout out the two uh, first authors on the paper, which are Dr. Allison uh, May and Dr. Aaron Mattingly, who were the first authors on the paper, and I'm just kind of presenting some of their work. Uh, so the total, title of the talk today is Programmatic Building of a Secretory Asinus is Driven by Neuronal to Epithelial, Neuregulin to ERB3 to mTORC2 Signaling. Sorry. Uh, so like I said, I'm from the Knox lab. So our primary goal in this lab is to understand a lot how about nerves regulate organogenesis and how um, we can use developmental models of embryogenesis to sort of instruct us on how to create new regenerative therapies. Um, and so one of our, the biggest things that we study is the salivary glands, actually. And the clinical reason, which I'm sure a lot of you know about, is something called hyper, uh, salivary gland hyperfunction. So you're not producing enough saliva. Um, commonly termed dry mouth syndrome, but more clinically termed xerostomia. Um, and the things that cause this, one of the most frequent is actually radiation treatment for people that have head and neck cancers. Uh, so people that get this radiation, it's like 80% of people end up with dry mouth syndrome. Um, also autoimmune disorders like Sjogren's, Sjogren's syndrome, syndrome, which someone was talking about today. And uh, of recent note is COVID-19, bacterial and viral infections can also give you dry mouth. And I'm sure it's not underappreciated in this crowd, but uh, no saliva really causes a lot of problems. You end up with a tooth decay, bacterial infections, gingivitis, you can't eat properly, malnutrition, wound healing is bad. It all goes wrong. Uh, so our question is sort of how do we build a functional salivary gland? So uh, when the salivary gland starts off uh, this development around E12, and uh, it goes from this cursive bud full of progenitors where there's no real organization or anything uh, to a really condensed sort of single layered 
epithelium where uh, you see it gets a lot smaller. These are on the same scale. Um, but we also get a lot of organization. You get this luminization with a hole in the middle. You get polarity proteins uh, lining up on this apical surface. And you get a, specific, a synar specification uh, markers such as MIST-1 and uh, secretory proteins like PSP. And then here I've got the in vitro IF images uh, where you can see all of these over time sort of acquiring. You get uh, MIST-1 in all the cells of the acinus. And you also get this really... Uh, specific luminized hole in the middle, which is important. So we started off with a bit of bulk sequencing to identify the timing of this uh, acinus uh, formation. So we conducted it at 24 hour intervals of the gland and we look at sort of the transcriptional changes between these different time points. Uh, so here you see on this graph, it's called a PCA plot and the closer these replicates in colors are together, that's how similar they are with their genetic signature. So you can see about E15 is like a massive jump from 14 and 16. So we kind of took E15 as a time point where a lot of these uh, transcriptional changes start to happen. And so one of these molecules that jumped out of us from the, the, bio, the RNA sequencing data was ERB3. Um, so it was turning on specifically at the E15 time point. And also importantly, it's localized to the, the embuds. Uh, it's not anywhere here to be seen in the ducts. So it's uh, we gathered it's important marker for ep epithelial uh, uh, specification. Um, and then we use this sort of in silico bioinformatics approach with single cell RNA sequencing data where you can group together all the different uh, cell populations. And what we could we found out was that this uh, uh, the ligand for OB3, sorry, is neuregulant. We can actually see the neuregulants coming from the nerves and it's uh, activating or uh, activating its receptor in the bud cells and a little bit in the duct cells. But yeah, it's this, primarily it's this uh, nerve to end bud signaling pathway that we found. So then we wanted to, uh, oh yeah, again, this is violin plot where you can see that neuregulin is completely in the nerves. Um, but yeah, so then we want to do a genetic deletion, much similar to the last talk where uh, we knock out OB3 using that same pre system. So I'm glad you introduced that so I don't have to talk through it, but um. Yeah, we knock it out and we see the massive depletion in acinocells. cells. There's like obviously way smaller. But we also see this complete loss in the um, specification. We've got no more MIST-1, which is our SINAR marker. And we also lose this polarity. So instead of getting in these wild types, we get these nice luminized ducts. It's just complete disorganization. Um, and then this is also just a heat map where you can see I've got some of these same genes like aquaporin-5 is another secretory protein. Um, they've gone from red in the wild type to blue, which means they're downregulated when we knock out OB3. So, uh, yeah, knocking it out, we lose all these programs. So then the converse of this, the reverse, is we want to see if we reintroduce neuregulant, can we bring these secretory programs back? Um, so we have a little uh, culture system that we use to do this, where we take uh, E13 slivery glands out of the mice and we dissect out the mesenchymal nerves. So we're just left with this epithelium. And then we culture this on like a floating membrane and add in new regulin every day. So the idea is that no new regulin can come from the nerves. We reintroduce it back in. And what we see is actually that the new regulin is sufficient to recapitulate this in vivo acinus formation. So in our um, new regulin treated cultures, we get these really nice embards with all the secretory programs turned on. Um, and it looks quite similar to what we see if we just cut open the mouse at E17 and have a look. Um, and then we also the same same thing happens with the polarity programs. We get nice luminized acini. Um, so yeah, it was quite interesting that new regulin was powerful enough to on its own to drive all these polar, uh, polarization and secretion. Um, so then, um, as a lot of you know, that if you're submitting to a bigger journal, it's not enough to just end the story there. They want some sort of downstream. What's the mechanism? What's actually happening uh, lower down the pathway? Um, so from literature and from RNA sequencing, we knew that neuregulin controlled the mTOR pathways, which uh, huge mTOR controls seemingly everything. Um, but there's mTOR1 and mTOR2. Um, so of the mTOR1 and 2, we looked at mTOR2 because when we stain for it, we see it's restricted to these mBuds. And also in our knockout, uh, in a wild type, you've got plenty of mTOR2 turning on. But when you knock it out, it, uh, knock out OB3, it's gone. So uh, we could kind of assume that uh, the neuregulin is downstream at talk 2 um, And this is where I kind of jumped into the paper is the reviewers were like, oh, we want more uh, more proof and more evidence that it actually is talk 2 and not talk one um, So I conducted these little experiments here where we did new regulin on its own. Like I said, you get this nice specification and polarization programs turning on. Um, and then if you use an inhibitor of just talk one you actually see that you still get this turning on. We get 
specification, polarization, lumens. Um, whereas if you use mTORC1 and 2 inhibitor, uh, it completely screws it up and we get inhibition of specification and the gland is way tinier. So mTORC1 alone inhibit, uh, it, it was still possible to get specification, but both of them together, it was done. So yeah, we concluded that therefore neuregulin goes to RB3, which goes to RB, um, mTORC2. And yeah, thanks. That's my little story today. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to know about the role of NRG1. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and is, uh, is it now to play a role in development of uh, adult in, uh, um, homeostasis? Yeah, um, yeah, so the question was about the role of neuregulin signaling in other tissues um, besides the salivary glands. Um, so yeah, it's it's not a hugely well studied molecule, but we see it pop up in a few places. It's actually really important in um, lactogenesis during pregnancy. So when the uh, mammary glands expand during pregnancy, um, they also need to create secretory ducts and luminization. And we know here that uh, new regulin plays a role there. Um, we also see it in a couple of other organs like the lung and uh, uh, its role in development, and we have it in the intestines as well. But this is kind of the first in-depth uh, exploration of new regulin's control and specification in the salivary glands at least, but yeah. Yeah, cool. Thanks everyone. <laughs> We have two more oral presenters. Uh, the next presenter is Ramin Farhad. He is a six year uh, DDS PhD candidate, and he's going to talk about functional characterization of large scale chromosomal deletions in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Please welcome Ramin. Okay. Hi, everyone. Today, I want to talk about large scale chromosomal deletions that happen in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. So, in head and neck cancers, the tumors arise from the cells of the upper food and airway passages. And the primary causes are alcohol, tobacco, and infections with Epstein-Barr virus and HPV. This is a clinical presentation. There are approximately 1.1 million uh, cases worldwide with a 50% mortality rate. And even successfully treated patients uh, have um, debilitating deficits in speech, swallowing, or breathing after surgery. So the subset of patients that are negative for the viruses and are caused by tobacco and alcohol tend to do significantly worse clinically. And their tumors tend to be, have a high mutation burden as well as large chromosomal changes. So you all know what a mutation is. For instance, a letter can be deleted out of a word. But when we talk about deletions, we're really talking about ripping several pages out of the book and causing large changes. So this is a map of common deletions that happen across all the chromosomes in head and neck tumors. And we're going to focus on chromosome number two, particularly this peak right here that I'm interested in, which happens to be located um, in a locus uh, within L a gene called LRP1B. And the odds of this happening by random chance alone is 10 to the minus 41. So these are the challenges we need to overcome to study these phenomena. One, we don't know much about the gene. It's very poorly characterized, and we know some studies suggest that it may be a tumor a suppressor. Two, there are no model systems actually for studying chromosomal deletions. And lastly, this gene is not even expressed in oral mucosa. And it raises the question as to why we even see such a large amount of uh, deletion in clinical cases despite terrible odds. So I hypothesized that there are hidden genetic elements within the sequence that when the deletion happens, those are removed, such as microRNAs or enhancers, and they are favorable. That situation is favorable for the tumors and allows them to grow. So first thing, I compiled all the deletion data to see if there are hotspots within the gene that this happens. And for the most part, they all located within the middle of the gene. 
So I propose that within, with CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, what we can do is to create one very large solution that kind of captures everything we see clinically. And in our laboratory, we make cancer from scratch using primary human keratinocytes. And we know from our work and work of other groups that TP53 and CDK and 2A, two um, tumor suppressors, they need to be essentially knocked out in order for um, other genetic, uh, genetic insults to take place. So this is the background essentially required for additional genetic insults to take place. And we use keratinocytes that are null for these two genes. This is the vector that I use for gene editing with, for CRISPR-Cas9. It encodes for the Cas9 enzyme. It has a guide RNA molecule, which guides the enzyme to the appropriate locus to create the cuts. And the cells that take up this plasmid will, because of this GFP molecule, will turn green, as seen here. So first thing I did was to transfect the cells with two plasmids. And after 24 hours, all the DNA was collected. And I designed PCR primers to test this out. So PCR only works when the primers are very close to each other. But I designed them to be 1 million base pairs apart, with the thought that only when the deletion happens, they're going to be right next to each other. And I ran the products on the gel, and these bands were excised and uh, sent out for sequencing. I tried to create 18 different unique deletions across LRP1B. And when the sequencing results came back, successfully was able to create that in all 18 samples, and we were able to remove over 1 million nucleotides in all the combinations. While we know that it works, this doesn't tell us anything about the efficiency of this process. So next thing, Similar process, transfect the cells, but this time I selected out the green cells using FACS, expanded them in culture, and then performed a qPCR, TACMAN copy number assay, which is a sensitive quanti quantitative measurement of copy number of a, a locus of interest in a cell. So I'm going to walk you through this. There are four sets of primers and probes that are used. The numbers one through four correlate to the ones down here, and there were three samples. Untreated is where there's no um, genetic alteration. LRP1B knockout, this is the beast best situation when we're just creating a single cut to create an indel, and deletion is actually when we're removing a giant piece of DNA. So if we take a look at sets number two and three, this is where we see the deletion happening, and this was repeated many, many times, and we can um, reliably create these deletions and reduce the copy number by 10 to 45% in keratinocytes. I maintain these cells in culture to see if there's a selective advantage, whether they can outgrow their neighbors or whether their neighbors can outgrow them. And actually, they're copy number neutral. Across both passages, nothing happens. But this is in a 2D environment when we're growing them inside a, um, a dish. So then I went 3D. Essentially, organotypic culture, simply put, we, we grow in vitro skin. That's what, they, what, that's what this is. We take a piece of um, cadaver skin, remove the epidermis and discard it, and use the dermis as a scaffold. We put fibroblasts underneath, and then we put genetically modified keratinocytes on top to recreate the epidermis. And we look to see if those cells invade into the dermis. So this is the histology work that I've done. These are H&E stains. This, pink la this purple layer right here is the epidermis, and this is the dermis right here. Normal conditions, this none of these cells should be invading into the dermis. So uh, when I look at the cells that bear the deletion, I saw strong evidence of invasion, which was kind of exciting. But to my surprise, I also saw that knocking out the gene gives me the exact same phenotype. Now, my, again, I want to remind you that this bit essentially tells me that the gene function is essential, but there is no gene function because the gene is not expressed. So this was kind of surprising. In order to make sure this wasn't a fluke, I repeated it a couple of times, and I essentially received the same results across uh, the repetition of this experiment. So the next thing I did was to create knockout mutations across three distant exons. And while exons 13 and 48 were able to replicate uh, the results that I already had uh, gotten, exon two across all the technical replicates, I was not able to see any evidence of invasion. So this needs to be repeated, but taking the results at face value, it suggests that the hypothesis is still valid that there's some intergenic element that's being disrupted here and it's not the gene function that we're looking for. So in case you zoned out in the last seven minutes, drinking and smoking cause cancer <laughs> and they rip pages out of your DNA and have developed a methodology to be able to study those missing pages. And when we apply this technique 
to the LRP1B locus, we see that there's invasion and that the cells adopt an invasive behavior. I want to thank the members of my lab, the UCSF community, and especially my funding sources for supporting my research. Thank you. Happy open to open questions. Hey, Ramin, that was great. I'm, I'm wondering if you've looked at different splice isoforms and whether that may explain whether different isoforms are expressed versus not expressed, and that explains the difference in effect. Yes, uh, I have looked at that. So essentially, I've looked at all the databases uh, in both healthy tissue, human postmortem tissue, and uh, TC. I've also looked at RNA seq uh, databases from TCGA to look at the splice forms. And I've performed an R, I, I didn't get to show that, but I also did a QPCR myself. Uh, we cannot find evidence of uh, expression at all. The only thing is, so, so skin has five layers and the basal layers is where actually all the stem cells are. It could be that there's very little expression in some of the cells and the basal layer, which the 2D culture is not able to capture. So uh, although QPCR is very sensitive, what we can do is do RNA scope actually on skin to definitively rule out um, any expression. And that I haven't done yet. Okay. Are you able to correlate your biopsy with any biopsy with any human cancer, early stage beta material, squamous cell, stem, and tissue cancer? Could you repeat the question? Can you corroborate? Okay. So, um, all squamous cell carcinomas tend to have similar deletions except the ones that originate from skin. So, and there's actually very little data in terms of, um, so no one's actually done any copy number analysis on the squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, but of the lung cer cervix, uh, those tend to have very similar patterns. So um, as of yet, we do not actually have the data for skin samples to be able to uh, make that connection. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry? I have not looked at that now. Thank you very much. Our last presenter is Jacqueline Ong. Um, she's second year dental student and he's, she's going to talk about effective orthodontic movement and periodontia. Uh, yeah, to the yeah. Okay, cool. Hello? Hello? Okay, cool. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Jacqueline Ong, and the title of my research is The Effect of Orthodontic Movement on Periodontium. So we all know that orthodontic movement can improve oral health by proper alignment of teeth. However, this force of movement can cause periodontal disruption and changes in tissue. There have been studies that have linked the loss of attachment uh, that have linked orthodontic treatment to the loss of attachment, alveolar bone loss, and apical root resorption. You can see from the picture right here. There's also been studies that have linked aesthetics, such as interdental black triangles, to orthodontic treatment. There have been controversial studies that have shown that positive torque within alveolar bony housing can reduce recession. However, all these factors don't talk about keratinized tissue width or interdental papilla fill width and height. Keratinized tissue width is important for periodontal stability and preventing recession. You can see from this photo, keratinized tissue width is measured from the gingival margin all the way to the mucogingival junction. The lack of interdental papilla fill width and height can cause aesthetic problems, which is really important in orthodontic treatment. You can see from this photo right here that food can get stuck in those areas and cause poor tissue stability. It can also lead to, from thick 
to thin phenotype, and thin phenotype can lead to fracturing or gum recession of teeth. So you can see mid-facial recession right here. So our research paper is going to look at two aims. The first aim is to measure the changes in alveolar bounty housing to the periodontal soft tissue. And the second is to quantify the degree of proclination and rotation. So how are we going to do this? The first part, our specific aim one, will be in green. So we're going to be measuring the periodontium, so that's the keratinized tissue with the gingival phenotype through UNC probing, and then using data analysis. The second specific aim will be using through orthodontic treatment, and that will be in blue, through the movement of teeth, dolphin imaging, scan. You can see dolphin imaging right here, and then digitalized scan right here, and we'll use graph analysis. We performed a prospective cohort study here at UCSF's orthodontic program, and we included the upper and lower central and lateral incisors, as well as the canines. We took two types of measurements, so two time periods, T0, which is the initial bonding of the orthodontic appliance, and T2, which is six months after that initial bonding. So at both of these time measurements, we use cone beam computed tomography, so CBCT right here, to take a 3D image. Right here, we have the um, axial, coronal, and sagittal plane. And then we also use digital itero scanning and for the periodontal measurements, UNC probing at each of these visits. We took patients with permanent dentition, no extractions due to orthodontic treatment, and minimal crowding about two to six millimeters. So the first measurement for orthodontics that we took was alveolar bony housing. So we measured from this manto enamel junction, three millimeters apical to get the crest, mid crest, and then the apical measurements labiolingually or labiopalatally. Then we also took the measurements of proclination. So we took from the long axis of the tooth from the palatal and mandibular plane. And then for rotation to make sure the teeth are rotating, we drew a midline in between the upper and lower arch and the incisal edge, and we took that angle, as you can see right here. For crowding, we used two size arch length discrepancy, so we subtracted the space required from the space available. And then from peri for periodontal parameters, we measured the thick and thinness of the gingiva, the keratinized tissue width here in red, and then the interdental papilla fill width and height. So for results, currently we have about 21 patients in our study. However, five patients were able to complete due to T2 being about a six month period. So, so for some of the results, you can see here that T0, the one in blue is going to be the initial time point where the orthodontic appliance was bonded. And then T2 is going to be the one in red, so that's six months after. And there's no general trend. So you can see there are minimal differences in the initial and final measurements. For mid-facial recession in all our patients, all the mid-facial recession decreased. In unison, as you can see, again, T0 in blue is initial, and T2 is six months after. And then the plaque score increased for all patients, and that can be due because it's difficult to brush your teeth due to orthodontic appliances in your mouth. Patient two was an exception. She um, was able to um, control her plaques before and after orthodontic appliance treatment. And then there was a slight decrease in papilla fill, so that means the gingiva around the embrasure decreased, and you can see that here from the red graphs. And then the papilla height and papital width both increased. So for orthodontic results, now we're not looking for trends. We're looking at if there was change in movement or rotation. So you can see here for proclination that there were changes and there were differences from the first initial bonding to the six months after. And then for crowding, there was decreased crowding, which is what we want for orthodontic treatment. And then change of rotation, you can see that there were all changes in rotation for all patients, which is great because the teeth are moving. And then for alveolar bony housing, so the bone was moving and increasing in width, labiopalatally and labiolingually. You can see the colors here for the different patients. And then the x-axis is going to be the type of tooth. So we have upper right three, upper right two, and so on and so forth. So our conclusion is that these observed changes in periodontium can be linked to keratinized tissue width and interdental papilla fill width and height, which is important so orthodontics and orthodontists could take into account the treatment of gingiva and periodontium, as well as the movement of teeth and their treatment planning. And then further observations are currently being conducted right here at UCSF. If you want some references, please feel free to scan the code. And a big thank you to Dr. Alex Lin, po Director of Postgraduate Residency Program, and Dr. Allison Jan and Tiffany Tse, who are both residents here at UCSF. Thank you.